think we're going to uh, resume. Can um, can everyone hear me? Secretary Murphy, can you hear me, sir? Excellent, excellent. Well, we are at the top of the hour. Um, for, you, for those of you uh, just joining us, uh, my name is Mitch Johnson. I lead the Federal Services Practice for Curtis Process Consulting. Um, welcome to the Defense Innovation Summit and uh, our second of two panels this morning. Uh, before we get moving, I'd like to uh, I'd like to give a quick shout out to uh, the entire America's Future Series team uh, that helped uh, pull all of this together, uh, that helped make a, our first panel this morning a, a great success. I'd like to give a special shout out to my uh, my partner in crime, Deepak Seth, who was instrumental in uh, help, helping pull everyone together and to make this flow uh, the way that it has. Um, Secretary Murphy, I mentioned that uh, panel number one went really well, so panel number two will have their work cut out for them, but I'm sure they're up to the task. Uh, so with that said, sir, I'm going to hand it off to you and take let, it, let, let you take panel two away. All right, thanks so much. I appreciate it, Mitch. I was just posting up on, uh, on LinkedIn uh, for our panelists to, to make sure um, we push out this great uh, information and the fact that we have this great panel. Uh, hey, listen, everybody, w welcome to our second panel. Our first one was really focused on uh, advanced technologies and national security. We're, we're diving deep here in the second panel where it's comprised of leaders who are gonna share their insights and their experiences to, regarding requirements and capabilities, as well as the associated uh, needs and use cases. So want to give a, a, a hearty welcome to our panelists. We're looking forward to a lively and enlightening dialogue over the next hour. And because we have a lot of ground to cover, I'm going to do a brief introduction of our, of our three panelists here. So let me begin by uh, introducing you to Lieutenant General Tom uh, Sharpie. He's a Deputy Chief of Staff for Capability Development at NATO's Supreme Allied Command uh, Transformation. At, that's in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, in his role, he's responsible for developing operational and strategic capability requirements on behalf of 30 NATO nations. Next, we have Lieutenant General Neil Thurgood. Uh, uh, General Thurgood is a director of hypersonics, directing energy, space, and rapid acquisition, uh, which includes leading the Army Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office, uh, and is responsible for the rapid fielding of select capabilities to deter and defeat rapidly modernizing adverse adversaries. And last but not least, Brigade General, uh, Breeder General, sorry, Breeder General uh, Ross Kaufman. He's a director of Next Generation Combat Vehicles, Cross-Functional Teams, uh, CFT, uh, with the Army Futures Command. Uh, he's tasked with leading the effort to overhaul the services inventory of combat vehicles and putting in place platforms that could overmatch peer capabilities and into the future. So just want to give a shout out and welcome to our panelists. Uh, before we get started, let me just give you some ground rules. I'm going to each ask, I'm going to ask each panelist a question and, and give you some time that for your response. Uh, but also, you know, the other panelists could chime in if they do so. I don't think it want, we don't want to be so stoic. Uh, make sure that you, we have this interaction going on because we want to have a dialogue. So in response to the first question, you know, the panelists uh, might also highlight anything from their bio, which maybe I missed, or to inform the audience of what they really do. So time permitting, we're gonna have uh, two rounds of questions, and then we're gonna have time for a closing statement. But again, we're here uh, with you from 11 o'clock to 12. So let's get cracking. Um, so first off to you, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Sharpie, uh, in your current role, you're responsible for developing and delivering operational and strategic capabilities for the warfighter. The complexity of developing capabilities for use between just the US services highlights the true scale of the change that you've been given. Uh, can you tell us a little about the challenges this task presents as well as the measure of success that you have within your role? Yeah, hey, thanks first, uh, Mitch. Thanks for your help, Deepak Seth. And Secretary Murphy, thanks for the opportunity to be here. You know, I'm outnumbered. You know, I'm the only guy wearing blue here. So um, hopefully, hopefully uh, the Army guys won't be too rough on me. But uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity. I mean, I, my first question to everybody would be, how many knew that there was a NATO headquarters in Norfolk, Virginia? 
probably not a lot of you because uh, uh, I knew about it, but I'm one of the few who knew about it before I came here. So thanks for the question. I think we're all struggling with, you know, similar, all the nations are struggling with similar challenges and opportunities, right? When we look at uh, technology and we look at emerging and disruptive technologies, we're all trying to figure out how do we get first to be able to deliver those capabilities. So I'm gonna break it down, try and make it simple, go to strategic and operational and define what success is. First of all, strategically, you know, I've done requirements in, in programming and a little bit of acquisition in my Air Force job. Um, and I thought it was complicated then, uh, especially going and trying to win the battles with CAPE to try and get things, not only the requirements right, uh, but then also getting the funding that, that allows you to be able to deliver. Uh, and that's challenged for just one service. And then across DOD, you try and integrate that in the four. Um, I thought it was very difficult. Well, when you get to NATO, I got to do that times 30 because each nation has a similar process that we use. And so that makes it, it's a little bit more difficult because each nation brings with it, you know, their own industrial and their military needs. Um, and they all want to compete for those resources to be able to win a contract. And so that makes it challenging. Um, the, the good news is, is the strength of the alliance is, is we have 30 partner nations and access to all their industry, to all their academia, to all of their science and technologists. Um, and so we are very fortunate to have an amazing breadth of talent that we can use to help solve some of those problems. Um, cultures are challenging, right? Because I will tell you that each culture has a little bit way of going about doing that. Um, and, the, and the challenge with, with it is not only is it hard in DOD to get our, our, um, our folks on the other side of the river to fund the capabilities you want to deliver, it's a challenge here because I have to go back to the nations. And the way they do it in NATO is not only you have to get approval to fund it into the budget, but then before you spend it in the year of execution, you got to go back and get them to approve it again. So we got to do it twice. Um, and then just getting them to see the, the, the uh, value of the investment, it's, it can be challenging at time because you have, it's in NATO, it's not necessarily about saying yes, it's about not saying no. Because if you, if you say no and break silence, then that means it's dead in the water until you bring that nation back in. So there's a lot of quid pro quo and trade space that happens to try and do that. Operationally, interoperability is our challenge, right? Because you bring, you know, just as we try and be interoperable between the services, we try and do that between 30 nations who are at varying levels of technology development, very levels at modernization, modernization of their weapon systems. That's a challenge, but it's also the answer. And so we try and bake in interoperability at day one into the requirements process. And then success, it's all about the warfighter, right? I mean, um, you know, the warfighter is the one who determines those requirements. If we make any changes to the requirements validation authority, they make sure that if we make any changes that's traced back to the original requirement where they say no. And we're in the, we're in the middle of two old, an old way where we didn't do that, a new way when we do that, a new way we deliver capabilities, and that's a challenge. Um, and I will tell you, uh, you know, the way I measure success is, you know, and my Aircom uh, brother is a CGSC classmate, and if I get it wrong, he will thump me in the head and tell me I'm wrong. And, and I also measure success by Sakir when he calls me on the phone because we spend all of our time talking about the operational fight and are we giving him what he needs. And when I hang up the phone, as long as I have a job, I consider myself successful. I'll stop there and turn it over to you. You're muted. The, the culture is a big deal, Tom. I appreciate your, your, your comments uh, with the 30 nations and, and obviously interoperability. Um, I'm gonna turn it over if it's okay now to, to uh, Breeder General Ross uh, Kaufman. And by the way, Tom, my brother's Air Force does search rescue with you guys down at Tyndall. So uh, we have a joint family, my dad's a Navy man. So, um, but Ross, let me, let me turn to you. You know, in, in uh, Lieutenant General uh, Sharpie's comments, you know, he, he talked about the convergence of the war fighter, interoperability and many other dimensions. Project uh, uh, Convergence is the Army's new campaign uh, of learning organized around um, a continuous structured series of demonstrations and experiments. What is Project uh, Convergence and what is the Army trying to demonstrate in Yuma just this past summer? Thank you, Mr. Secretary. So Project Convergence 20 was the first year of the campaign of learning. Uh, we really uh, worked on one mission thread and that was sensor to shooter. Uh, we sense very well across the Joint Force and with our coalition, we shoot pretty darn good too. But it's the middle, right? It's the two. It's linking the sensor to the shooter. That's what we did in, in Yuma. But Project Convergence as a whole is really focused on 
people, weapon system, command and control, information, and terrain. Uh, it starts with people because while, while we often get enamored by terms like artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, autonomy, uh, we can't ever lose sight of everything we do, uh, whether it's General Sharpie, General Thurgood, myself, the entire uh, DOD and coalition team trying to get new equipment. It's all about the men and women in uniform and getting them the best. Right? You know, so we can get spun around technology, but really, as long as we're focused on the people and the and the business end of our profession, that that's I think we're going to be moving in the right direction. Um, out at Yuma this year, Mr. Secretary, we we took uh, about 700 people and several new technologies and really put it at the strategic, operational, and tactical level, focused on uh, this concept of multi-domain operations. So you're talking at the strategic level, spaceborne and high altitude sensors, passing information to shooters on the ground. Uh, at the operational level, it's uh, aerial sensors passing targets to other aerial sensors and also to ground uh, effectors. And then when we moved into the tactical, uh, that's ground vehicles armed with algorithms that can identify vehicles by type and geolocate those vehicles. And then populate that information across the entire joint force so everyone has, knows where the enemy is. And, uh, that hasn't happened to any army since Agincourt that I know of, that you knew where all the enemy was. And uh, while that occurs, a brain in the background knows where all of the joint uh, shooters are and then pairs the best shooter with every target on the battlefield. That's really what Project Convergence 20 was about. And uh, it was successful. We were able to talk to the Joint Force uh, F-35s, uh, as well as Osprey. We were able to uh, work with JSOC. But really, this was about the Army getting its first step correct uh, moving forward. Next year, we'll uh, bring in our joint partners. All of the services are absolutely on board with this. And the following year, we tie in the coalition, because as General Sharpie knows better than anyone, uh, we will never fight alone. So we, we are mindful of that and uh, very, very excited of what Project Convergence will, will deliver us in the future. Yeah, and I appreciate how you, you mentioned, you know, uh, Convergence means uh, collaboration. Collaboration is key, especially when, uh, you know, we are as obviously fighting more joint, not just with our own forces, but as was mentioned just previously with our NATO allies. Um, let me turn over to you, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Thurgood. So, so Neil, your work focused on the rapid prototyping of technologies. How is your approach to prototyping different today than it has in years past? And Neil, I think you're on. Hopefully, you heard me okay. Neil, uh, I think you're on mute. Lieutenant General Neil Thurgood, can you hear me okay? I tell you what, we'll go back to, uh, to General Thurgood because uh, I think other folks here could, could hear me. It looks that way. Um, hey, if uh, I, Secretary, if, I, if you need to, I can chime in and I can just talk a little bit about, you know, the integration piece from the last discussion, if that abides sure. time for to come in. You know, I, I think the fact that, you know, we all have similar challenges and that integration of forces and fires and we'll never fight alone. You know, we're tracking all the great work that's going on with Convergence and what's going on with JADC2. And I know there's a question coming later on that, but, but you know, our, our, we just want um, to have a rel NATO version of that, right? Because it's not only about how do you deliver technologies and how do you, you know, get it into the fight fast enough, but then how do you make it so that the partners um, and the rel NATO version have access to that and the data and the information so that as an alliance, we're interoperable together. And so, you know, those are all great things, but uh, I just want to make sure that we have a path to bring it so that we can share it and collaborate and interoperate within the Alliance to make it as effective as it's going to be within the DOD, over. Hey, and General Sharby, I'd say before before I took this job, uh, I was planted firmly and posed on Poland, uh, working right alongside uh, all, all the people that, that you work with every day. Um, and it was it was doggone frustrating when when we couldn't talk, okay, systems were, so we, we have to be mindful of it up front. We have to cook it in at the beginning rather than getting across the finish line and then trying to find some translator that, that 
makes uh, NATO countries talk. So we're mindful of it. Uh, and we think we've got a good plan for FY22 uh, to make that happen. Project Emergence 22 is going to be focused on that. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know if we'll ever have to use it, but the fact that we'll have it, we have that capability, will deter uh, anyone that dares uh, challenge us. Uh, no doubt. Uh, hey, uh, Tom, I'm going to go back to you, if, if that's okay. You know, it's no secret that uh, the face of warfare is seeing significant changes and that the future threats that we face are unlike any other that we've had in the past. Um, rapid technological development is forcing the United States and others to move from antiquated, antiquated and slow acquisition models to more agile, fast processes. Uh, one example of this is the announcement that is part of the next generation of air dominance program that Air Force uh, built and flew full scale flight demonstrator in just under a year. Under a year is, is amazing and almost inconceivable speed. In the context of NATO, though, how do you feel the process of advancement, such as what we've seen within uh, NGAD, uh, the Jake and others, and assist our allies? Uh, as we take these steps to increase the speed at we develop and field new capabilities. Yeah, no, I, thanks for secretary. That's a great question. You know, I, I, <clears throat> I think that, you know, uh, because the world has changed and that means that we have to change our process. Let me just give you a little, uh, uh, something that keeps me awake at night. When I first got here, we did a, an audit of our capability delivery timelines and we averaged, averaged 16.4 years. That's unacceptable in today's fight because we were delivering obsolescence. And so not only is the world changed, our dynamic peer competitors and our adversaries, potential adversaries, they don't, they don't have the same bureaucratic oversight and processes that we do. So we have to figure out how do we leverage the gains in technology and strides in delivery that industry, when they're delivering things in months or weeks, that it's taking us years or decades to deliver. And so we have to collaborate with industry. We have to use the techniques, tactics, and procedures that they are using, DevSecOps, agile development, all of these things that are working in industry. And we got to embrace them and use them within our own uh, acquisition and procurement processes and change some of the policies, right? I think that, you know, DevSecDef made some challenges into the FARs that allowed things to happen, SBIR, some of those things within DOD that I'm trying to replicate here in NATO. And it's not just the procurement process, but it's how you fund. Um, because our adversaries are going to beat us and they're going to maintain that military edge unless we can do the same things faster and better. And with NATO, with that huge network of talent that I talked about, we have to figure out how do we leverage that to come together. Um, you know, JAD, C2, and NGAD are great. They're awesome. I'm tracking everything that's going on. Um, the challenge is with the NATO, I would love to be able to do a single domain command and control system that works well. Um, I just spent the last 19 months on a project evaluating a system that, that we're trying to figure out how to make work. And it was supposed to be IOC in 2004, and it's still not achieving the success that we needed to. Um, and so then I'd like, if we can do a single domain, the process of a single domain, just like you know, some of those talk about, then you can do a multi-domain and then the, the panacea is that all domain construct. But in NATO, I gotta go slow because I gotta have 30 nations understand how we do that. And I'm fully tracking, you know, the, the fact that if we can leverage what the great work that Convergence is doing, which ADC do and, and all domain, then we're going to just be benefit from that. Um, and then it's, you know, you can do it quick, you can do it right. You know, I'd rather go quick sometimes. And that means we have to have in a, a culture that allows you to sometimes fail. You know, I, I remember Jeff Bezos talked at AFA a couple of years ago. He says in DOD, we're risk averse and we don't like to do experiments. We do demos. Demos means, you know, it's going to work. And in his in Amazon, he does thousands of experiments a year and three or four of them work. The good news is those three or four pay for the rest. We got to get to that culture of being able to fail and fail fast and fail often in order to be able to stretch the bounds of where we're trying to go. And then lastly, that question about balancing the risk, right? How much risk are we willing to accept? And in NATO, they're very risk averse because they want to control the funding. And, you know, I love the initiatives that DOD has done with giving you the ability to go out and get contracts, get them fast, SBIR, and then be able to go from concept to delivery and the timelines that are afforded so that we deliver at relevance. Uh, hopefully I'll stop there, but I think you get the idea that we gotta go faster because if we don't, we're gonna lose, over. That's great, appreciate it. And, and I think we had uh, 
Lieutenant General Neil Thurgood on. Uh, hey, sir, I know your screen's off now, but can you hear us or should we move on? No, hey, hey, Mr. That I think we're we're back up. That that's great. And even if you even if you just want to answer the question and not go on video, if that helps uh, tech, I know that sometimes that happens to me. Uh, no worries. But hey, 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 Neil, we want to just touch base with you. And, and uh, I'm not sure if you heard my earlier question. I know we had uh, Tom Sharpie uh, kind of chime in a little bit, but your work focusing on rapid prototyping and technologies uh, of technologies. What's your your approach to prototyping different today than it was in years past? Uh, especially the emphasis on speed. Hey, Mr. Secretary, thanks. Uh, sorry about the, the technical issues. Uh, glad, glad to be here. Uh, glad to be part of the panel with, uh, with Tom and Ross. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity for allowing us to, to, to talk a little bit about this, uh, this point in history that we're at. We, we are at an interesting time. Uh, I would say a tipping point in our history where the Army is trying to modernize uh, at a much rapid uh much rapid pace compared to the past. Uh, and in doing that, um, sometimes we have to change our, our behavior and how we're organized for combat uh, in this particular realm. And I think you heard Tom talk about, you know, the need to coalesce that across the NATO nations. You heard Ross talk about that with uh, project convergence and looking at how we do things different. Uh, the, this organization uh, that, that I was asked to stand up is designed uh, to be uh, a very unique in its structure and its authorities, uh, which allows us to change our behavior and how we do things faster. And, and I'll try to describe that for you. Uh, as, as both Tom and Ross talked about, we exist for one sole purpose, and that is to put prototype equipment in the hands of soldiers to combat units. Uh, we, we don't produce equipment to go to some test facility somewhere to go look, be looked at for multiple years. Uh, we don't build equipment uh, to see uh, if, if, uh, uh, the technology uh, is mature. Uh, we pick uh, projects uh, that are assigned to us from the Secretary of the Army and what we call the Army Board of Directors, which is really represents the, the requirement side and the acquisition side. So on, on my Board of Directors, I have the Secretary of the Army, the Undersecretary, and Honorable Jetty, where we get our Secretary of Authorities, Title 10 Authorities from. And then we have the Chief of Staff, uh, the Vice Chief of Staff and General Murray from the Army Futures Command, where we get our requirements and our priorities from. And so I'm a direct report to that group of, of, uh, of senior leaders who are absolutely uh, phenomenal, in my opinion. Um, so we have a very short chain of command from the secretary to the execution of, of the material solution uh, when the requirements established. Uh, and I'll give you I'll give you an example of, of what I'm talking about. Um, in our organization, we we don't make up our own mission sets. It's given to us from the board of directors. So when we got the hypersonics mission, um, after uh, us initial analysis, um, we got called in on the 14th of February last year. Uh, we had 30 days to come back with a strategic plan. I had to execute that program. And the mission was really simple. Neil, deliver a hypersonic uh, weapon in FY23. What are your questions? And so when you have a very clear direction from the senior leaders, who have bound the box, right? So we call that block one uh, in a very defined timeline. And then uh, the last piece of that, that, that stool is of course the resources to execute that. And so for hypersonics or mid-range capability for directed energy, um, we, we have very clear mission sets on very specific timelines uh, that keep us uh, uh, and bring us to parity with our adversaries. You know, why we army and as a for the last 19 years on the global war on terror, our adversaries have been modernizing. Hence, we've changed our national defense strategy. We know they focus on a great power competition. If you want to get to that timeline, you got to do different. So we have a very smart reporting chain. And then uh, we've been given the uh, contracting authority and the milestone decision authority, the ability to make contracts and the ability to spend money Congress authorizes uh, to execute that mission. And uh, so those, those things allow us uh, to have clarity in the future of what we want. In order to execute that at the tactical level, in a programmatic level, uh, we literally uh, bring the, the S&T teams out of the labs that, that invented the technology. We, we pluck them out of their parent organization and bring them in onto my team. 
Um, and so we have custody of the knowledge and the, and the technology from the SMT community. We bring it to us and we build a prototype of that at a combat unit. So it's a battery or a platoon level. And we call that block one. And while we're doing that, uh, we do three other things that are a little bit unique. So the first thing that we do is we bring the soldiers in on day one. Uh, in the Army, we call that soldier center design. And so we've been working on the DEM Shore Ad mission set, uh, which is, is uh, high energy lasers on the battlefield and the maneuver units to, to do uh, protection of our forces. Uh, we got that mission set almost 14 months ago. We already have a thousand hours of soldiers in the design process, not at the end, not at the end where we go do some test. We bring them in the design process. Um, and so they're actually uh, helping us design this so that we have a very close tie to the user. At the end of this uh, prototyping event, the block one, and why we collect good ideas, anything that takes more time and money, we call that block two. <laughs> and so if you don't snap the chalk line hard, and hold to that chalk, chalk line, then, you, then then programs grow over time, right? Not because it's evil, it's because that they they uh, they let let sometimes uh, the good idea carry them beyond uh, the initial requirement. Um, and so we're re really lucky that way. Uh, and then the last thing I would just uh, say about this particular organization is, uh, and and again, it has to do with the focus that Tom and Ross talked about. It's insufficient to show up with a shiny widget at a unit. That, that's not how we field equipment. Uh, we field equipment with doctrine that goes with it, with leadership, with training, with facilities, with policies. Uh, and so uh, we formed a group uh, um, called the Octagon. Uh, I called it the Octagon because there's eight of us. <laughs> I'm not overly original. Uh, there are These are the other eight general officers who own the other parts of fielding equipment. So the doctrinal part uh, for directed energy, for example, is at, at the Fire Center of Excellence. That's Major General Camper. The AFC CFT leads, uh, that general officer. Uh, we bring in the test general officer. We bring in the doctrine general officer. We bring in the eight general officers that control different parts of the doctrine, the training, the leadership. I'm the material guy. Uh, and so I kind of, as a senior officer, also kind of lead that group. Uh, but it's insufficient to go fast with material if when you get to the unit, you don't have a doctrine and a policy and a training program uh, to give them that capability. And so this group that we formed called the Octagon uh, helps us bridge uh, the behavioral changes. So we don't spend a lot of time in the JSIDS process. It's, it, that process is a little bit too slow for us. We don't spend a lot of time in the traditional PEO structures. You know, I've been a PEO. I understand that world. I understand the Jason's world. And so when you have a very short chain, uh, you have custody of the technologies, uh, then you can move fast and change your behavior. And, and then the last piece that we do is uh, when we decide on the mission set uh, that the board gives us, and we do our strategic back brief to them, which is about 30 days after the mission set, uh, we bring with us the transition team what we call the transition team. The transition team is the PEO that's going to assume this program, uh, given that it works, given the technology does what we want it to as a program or record. And so, you, you know, as traditionally as we do uh, in SMT projects, there's this thing people refer to as the valley of death. Stuff never moves from SMT to the hands of our soldiers. And we invest lots of dollars to do that. Um, one of the ways you overcome that is, is you combine those teams, s and people and program record people into one group, right? Very untraditional, uh, very much like a venture capitalist organization. We bring teams together, we aggregate them for an outcome. And then at 23, when we're done, we'll disaggregate the team. All the team and all the money will go to the PEO. I, I won't in 23 and 24 have any residual capability for hypersonics. It all moves forward. And so, um, very not traditional government-like in our behavior and our structure and, and our authorities match that. So our transition teams are assigned to us. They're doing the palm planning uh, beyond the prototype. Because if, if you produce the battery and then you start the palm planning, you're immediately two more years away. We, we can't allow that. You, you've got to be nested together 
from science and technology through prototyping to programs of record. And so we've been given the authorities uh, and the direction from the board of directors to execute that in a, a little bit different way. And we do that to Tom's point, I think we also do that with our partner nations. I, I, I don't, I don't have, I don't care where the technology comes from. I, I don't care if it's from our partner nation. I don't, and if the partner what nation wants to be involved with us, we get them involved in our process. Um, so there is a, there is a way to do this, but it takes a concerted focused effort. Uh, it takes uh, an understanding of the rules and laws that are associated with it. And then how we move faster as we change our behavior and change our structures to do that. And I'll, I'll pause there if that's helpful, Mr. Secretary. Uh, it's very helpful. Thanks, Neil. I appreciate that. And you know, we did talk about, you know, the Valley death and then that, that buy-in, you know, when you talk about that transition team, the buy-in with the PEOs and uh, exactly right. And then linking it um, throughout the process. So appreciate it. I'm going to turn to the uh, uh, Ross, if that's okay. Uh, uh, General Kaufman, you know, we talked about Project Convergence uh, earlier, and I know the DOD and the, the Air Force are moving forward on, uh, I, is it JADC2 and ABMC? Could you talk to us about what those joint initiatives are and, and walk us through kind of that for the audience, uh, what it is and some of the challenges you're facing with it? Sure. So in, in overall construct, Mr. Secretary, what you have is the management of information across the battlefield. That's what all of this, all these efforts really center around, is how does that information uh, get uh, gathered and processed and used? Um, look, the Joint All Domain Command and Control uh, is, is really the term that uh, it, it comes from the you know, Department of Defense, that is the overall joint uh, construct and and the army, which I think uh, General Sharpie will like, is the army is added a C to the front of it, so it's a uh, combined joint all the main command and control because we we know that we'll always fight uh, with our allies and partners. Uh, so that's the overall construct. The advanced battle management system, battlefield management system that the Air Force is uh, working on. That's called it uh, as described by. Uh, Mr. Roper is it's an internet of things, right? It's not a thing. It's the linkage of information management across the battlefield. We're all trying to get this information so that commanders can make decisions faster because whatever commander can see first, understand first and decide first on the future battlefield will win. And we all have to be mindful that this is not unique. Uh, our adversaries are trying to solve this problem as well. And it goes back to Boyd's OODA loop and, and just making sure that we understand what information is needed where. Processing on the edge, critical. Uh, deciding and having rules where, what information needs to trans, transition across the network. Our network is, you know, it's the spine. Okay, across the joint coalition, it is a, the spine and how it's limited. So if a sensor can pass information five feet uh, to the effector, it, does, that information may not need to go all the way back uh, to a sanctuary just to bounce forward five feet. It can be done. But we need those rules based on, um, on our optimization computing as well as our artificial intelligence. And uh, the last thing I'd like to highlight on, in, on this effort is you know, the term AI gets thrown around a lot. And uh, you always know that you're dealing with someone that's not very comfortable with the term when they, their main point is it's all about the data. Uh, it is all about the data, but there's so much more. And when you start uh, talking about ground to ground sensing, right? So you, a sensor that can detect a ground target. Uh, this, is, this is ground uh, that we will continue to replow because it doesn't have, sensing from the air to ground is, is a challenge, but it's an easier challenge than ground to ground with the clutter, the, the camouflage, the hiding in plain sight. I mean, uh, you can spoof a ground to ground uh, algorithm 
fairly easily. And that goes both for, for our adversaries and for us. So we're mindful of that and working through it. But uh, at Project Convergence, we, we captured and labeled over 3.5 million ground to ground uh, training sets, right? That's not enough. Okay, that, that is probably a 12th of what we need to do. And then that's, that's just on the limited uh, targets we were trying to detect. When you start talking about every potential adversary combat system, it, it almost becomes uh, you know, terabytes of data that, that will take us a very, very long time. So we've asked industry to come at, come uh, with synthetic training solutions. It's not as good as real data, but uh, we're looking towards that. Uh, you know, there's claims out there that you could take one, one single image uh, and then change the weather conditions, heating patterns, range, et cetera, and train algorithms very fast. Uh, I've heard a lot of claims about it, uh, but in this case, I'm from Missouri because we're not seeing the results uh, that we truly want. So hopeful, but we're not betting the farm on it yet. So really that, that's what uh, I think how it all kind of links together. Uh, but in closing this topic, I would say what's really encouraging is the uh, Army Air Force talks that have taken place, a uh, really historic event uh, in the last 30 days. Uh, the Marine Corps is absolutely all in, the Navy is in, and so this JADC2 construct, everyone is working towards it, and now uh, I am very, very confident that we are work working together to get to a common end state. Well, that's great, Ross. Appreciate it, and and I do appreciate your comment about uh, Missouri being the show me state, uh, and and you're showing the speed and collaboration. Uh, I thought General Murray's uh, earlier comment about you know the success we've already made, but in 2021 it's really going to be this joint effort, and then in 2022, really you know as it goes that uh, what what Tom Sharpie cares about really that our our allies uh, and in NATO as well. Uh, hey Neil, let me let me turn to you if, if that's okay. Um, uh, back at you. How is the Army Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office? How are they incorporating uh, soldier input into the prototyping process that's discussed earlier? You know, when I, you know, when I was helping run the Army with, with General Milley, the Washington Post said they referred to me as like the soldier secretary, right? And it's because I was always focused on. Hey, how will the soldier feel about this? These policies and breaking it down, you know, how do you how do you get their input and and how does it uh, affect your lane and how you move forward? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Secretary. So I I think there's a couple of uh, aspects of of what we call soldier centered design that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, I think the first aspect is is what we've all been poking at, which is we in the material worlds exist for one thing, and that that is to give a soldier a piece of equipment they can use on the battlefield. If they can't use it, if it's not reliable, if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, it's just a paperweight uh, and a really expensive paperweight. And so we have to be uh, particularly critical on ourselves as as we look at this. Now, I'm a little bit uh, I'm, uh, sensitive to the soldier center design, having started as a young enlisted soldier early in my career. Um, and so um, and I'll just use a couple of examples. So so in hypersonics. Um, as we're as we're designing the launcher, as we're designing the material solution, we literally um, on go we got to General Camper, who's the Fire Center of Excellence commander, right? He owns the soldiers that are in this this particular MOS, uh, and assign us soldiers. We want E fives and below, E fives and above, warrant officers and officers. We want a mix of soldiers. And, and we take them out into a facility uh, out in, in uh, Colorado where we have virtually created the entire weapon system. And so literally they, they put on uh, three-dimensional three virtual reality uh, vision systems and they walk up to and touch, they move through the weapon system uh, and, and they practice taking parts on and off <laughs> in, in their individual battle equipment. So for example, we, we had two generators placed on our trailer uh, for the hypersonic weapon. The soldier couldn't squat with their individual battle armor on and change uh, one of the face plates on the generator. So we actually moved 
move the generator apart virtually as we did the design. Now, if I had done that during an OT event, <laughs> you know, four years after we designed it, that would be hugely expensive to do and, and probably not helped our soldiers. Uh, in this case, we can literally have them walk through with their battle equipment, change apart, and, and let them maneuver in the battle space and then move it now while we're designing it. Um, and so it's hugely, hugely helpful. The second part of that is an LRHW because we're all of our programs are on a fast timeline. We actually know the unit we're going to. So we're actually talking to the unit right now who's going to own this first prototype battery, the block one battery, about uh, how they're going to use it in the battle space. How, how do I move it? How do I drive it? How do I get it set up in the battle space? How long is it going to take me to get it on a C-17 and off a C-17? With today's technology, you can practice that in the design phase. You don't have to wait five years to build one and then realize that it's two inches too tall or three inches too wide to get it on and off a C-17. So we practice that uh, even today. Uh, and so that's really, really helpful for us. On the directed energy side, as I mentioned before, over a thousand hours of soldier center design. We actually have had uh, earlier prototypes uh, just designed out of the S&T community who, who had low power lasers out at Fort Sill shooting them. We got a, over, a, over 150 kills with lasers in the live environment on early design work that the S&T community came with. And so we take that work and build on it. And then again, because we're putting a 50 kilowatt laser on a striker, that, that's a pretty hard challenge for industry, right? Because they got to shrink the technology down. They got to get it onto a striker so it can be with the maneuver elements. And so again, General Camper, uh, we've got soldiers, first sergeants, warrant officers at the factory at, right now, and we're, and we're still doing the design. We, we haven't even built the first one. <laughs> and we've got soldiers looking at the equipment and, and, and seeing how they're going to operate that equipment. Uh, and then the last piece of the soldier center design is, I, I would just say that the younger generation of soldiers, uh, they, they are very adaptive. I, I would say much more adaptive than I was. As a, as a young soldier. I mean, they're quick with technology. They're quick with ideas and information. They know how to use technology. Uh, they're very adaptive to it. And so we're taking that, um, that new, new construct that these young soldiers are bringing to us and, uh, and using that. So they sit with our software engineers. They sit with our design engineers. Um, again, very untraditional, right? Normally we would do a bunch of design work, present something to a soldier, you know, after we've built a piece of hardware, we don't have time for that work. We've got to come together as an organization, as a team, community, whether it's allied with partner nations on hypersonics or directed energy, get in the fight right now. And so that we get it there, we can immediately have a viable piece of combat equipment for our soldiers um, and then go right into full rate or you know low initial rate production or full rate production, entering in what we traditionally call the milestone C. Uh, that's our goal. We, we, we don't want to go back to A and B. We want to move right to production um, with our block one capability. And, and in all cases, we, we know what block two looks like. We know what technologies we need to block two. And so the S&T community is continuing to work on block two because that technology is not mature enough yet. We know what we want. It's not mature enough yet. So we can then feed it into the, into the weapons platform as, as quickly as we can. And so I think it's been very a very good example of success. There, there are other offices who are starting to do this, uh, the same kind of kind of effort. And uh, and I think it's a very important that that our soldiers who are going to use this equipment in combat are confident with it. The way they get that is experience. And we get that experience to them as fast as we can. Uh, over. That's great. Hey, Tom, and, Tom and Ross, would you want to chime in and, from your perspective on uh, on these thoughts? Yeah, no, hey, I'll, I'll go, uh, you know, I, thanks for the, you know, the, the block one right to production, right? I think that is phenomenal. I mean, I'm fighting that battle today with, uh, you know, the bureaucratic process overseers in Brussels, which is hard to convince them, because it's all about control. And I think that the ability that you have those authorities to be able to do that, um, having that board of directors that gives you that precise guidance and the ability to go to block one, right, right to that production is something that we're struggling with. We're doing it in small steps. We're doing it with software. We're using DevSecOps, you know, with based on the Castle Run model to put the coders 
um, the operators in a room to develop what they need. Like you said, the young soldiers being in the beginning of the process and then carrying it through to the end to deliver that. We've had success in that. But the big challenge complex programs, um, that oversight is still tension. There's still too much tension because there's not the trust in us to be able to do that. And so I might come and see you and figure out, you know, from your model, how you shorten that and change that behavior that it took to have that oversight to delivery and that OODA loop to go a lot faster because we have to, if we're going to be successful. And so, you know, I got to try and sell that within Brussels. And uh, so I'll look, reach out to try and figure out how to do that. But you're exactly right. Speed matters. Um, delivering the right effects matters and having the soldiers, sailors, and Marines at the beginning to the same tool they can use at the end is vitally important. Over. And what I would add, Mr. Secretary, is look, this isn't just uh, getting soldiers involved. It, it is a ch change of mindset and it's a being honest with ourselves that we are not omnipotent. We don't know what uh, is that exactly is needed on the battlefield in one person's brain. And that uh, that as we change this as our culture, we don't care what the rank is, okay? I don't really care what the uniform looks like. I just care what's above the shoulders. And what, you know, here in Detroit, we have soldiers sitting with scientists almost on a weekly basis, working on uh, the, next, uh, the next tank, the, uh, the next infantry fighting vehicle, our robotics efforts. I mean, this week we're working on amphibious operations with robotics. I have Marines, I have uh, soldiers sitting next to engineers and scientists solving hard problems. What we as leadership really need to do and what General Thorogood kind of indicated his, uh, his small uh, chain of command to the top is we need to spend more time work clearly articulating the problem we're trying to solve, get soldier feedback on it so we iterate it and we, we identify the right problem to solve and then we have our soldiers, airmen, Marines, sailors, get it, refine that, continue through the process. And uh, as General Thurgood said, but you don't wanna show up with a, you know, here, here's the present that we delivered you after 15 years. We want people involved throughout the entire process. And what my colleague, uh, Dave Hodney, uh, is doing with Microsoft and IVAS, they've had special operators, uh, regular soldiers like myself, just touching IBAS, uh, the new new goggle for our uh, dismounted infantrymen and women, uh, through the process, iterating, continuously improving, and they're demonstrating that uh, this week uh, in Virginia. So really, I think it's a mindset, it's a culture uh, that soldiers, you know, their opinion matters throughout the entire process. Hey, Mr. Secretary, if I, if I could just add one yeah, on the please. comment, uh, sir. Th there's a, a piece of this that uh, is also part of this triad of, of how we get things done faster, and that part is industry. Uh, and it's, it's how we bring industry into this process. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example um, that I think that is embedded with what Tom and Ross and I have been talking about. So I, I mentioned earlier, we bring the S&T over to our organization. We bring the PO over to our organization. We bring the soldiers into our organization. Uh, that team that we've aggregated includes uh, a fourth leg, and that's industry. And so uh, we are very, very transparent. In fact, in my contracts, I make it a requirement that the contractor will put a decision maker in my office. Uh, so, so think about that construct. It, it's not about us and them. It's about us, the team, and having a decision maker in my office that can that comes to my staff call. They see my budget documents. They see how we're making decisions. We're a hundred percent transparent. Uh, and and sometimes when you get like hypersonics where there's fundamentally six six industrial partners, um, when we got that team together, we said, okay, everybody sign an NDA. You're going to be totally transparent on your budget, your I am your integrator master schedule. And we're going to be open kimono with everybody. And at first, everybody looked at me like, you know, there's there's Thurgood. He, you know, he's he's uh, got this crazy notion. Uh, but I, I would tell you, it's been a phenomenal response from industry. We, we we don't have time to send letters back and forth to each other in contracting formal things. We'll do that as part of the process. We don't have time to wait for 30 days or three months to get a cedro deliverable 
approved. I, I tell my team, you have 24 hours. When you when that seed drill gets here, you have better to help write it. It better not be new to you. Um, and so this partnership, uh, we have to behave different across all spectrums. And bringing industry in has uh, been really an interesting challenge, and they've responded very well. And some of them, quite frankly, were uncomfortable with that at the beginning, with uncomfortable with the transparency uh, and making sure that we stay in line with the law but making sure that we're transparent and rapid in our decision-making processes across across the spectrum uh, as we go forward. So there's a, a piece of this that industries responded to very well. Over. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it is a change of culture. I mean, to, to drive these public-private partnerships to make sure that our war fighters do not have a fair fight, that they have a technical and tactical advantage over enemy is critical, especially during these moments. So I appreciate that. Hey, we're, I know we're running out of time. I'd love to go around the horn real quick. If everyone could just take maybe two minutes. Um, uh, Tom, would you mind leading off? Just give us your final thoughts, uh, conclusions, uh, anything you'd like to share with, with, with the team? Yeah, no. Hey, Mr. Secretary, I, I, you know, this is very satisfying for me because I, I'm in the same journey as my brothers, you know, Neil and Ross. Um, the good news is, is I think that uh, we're all trying to do the same thing. We're going about it differently. Um, because of where they're at and the maturity of this. Um, I'm envious of some of the progress that they've been able to make. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it's about how do we do this together, right? I have to do, I have to learn from my partners in DOD and then try and bring that process and try and replicate that in NATO. And it's just harder. It doesn't mean I'm, we're not going to do it. It's just harder um, because of the, the 30 different board of directors that we have to get approvals for. Um, but, but I think that what we're trying to do is take the, the best of the best and replicate that, right? Let's, let's do this eyes wide open. You know, plagiarism is the greatest form of flattery when I see a good process from somebody, as long as it's not an academic setting, my AU brothers need me to say that, you know, how do, we level, how do we make it an unfair fight? And how do we take those ideas and turn them into realities and put them into the hands of the warfighter faster with the right capability? Um, and that's where that requirements and the process that, that we all talked about. Um, but uh, it's, we got to do it right and we got to do it faster and uh, we got to do it within the budgets that we're given. And uh, it's a challenge for me in NATO, but I think I got some good contacts that are going to help me figure out how to sell it to my partners in Brussels. So I'll pause there. Thanks for the opportunity. It's been great. Thanks. Hey, no, thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Hey, Ross, can I turn to you now? Give us your thoughts. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, but we've talked a lot about process. We've talked a lot about people uh, and a little bit about technology. What I'd like to close with is, you know, as we're moving forward and we're thinking about the way we'll fight battles in the future, how we will identify our adversaries, make decisions faster and eradicate those adversaries as required. Um, it's really gonna come down to autonomy, artificial intelligence and robotics. And it'll, and if you frame it in those three areas, uh, being mindful of open systems architecture and who owns the IP. We, we need to start thinking differently with both uh, the government and industry, well, our coalition partners. Uh, okay, how will industry make a profit in the future? Right? Because we, we want this open system architecture we want uh, the IP where you know we're not charged uh, an exorbitant amount for a small change, um, but I, I think we need to work together moving forward so that we, we understand uh, industries in the P business. They're not in the P and L. No, no one's interested in loss, but uh, the government has to move forward, and that's going to enable our work with General Sharpie and his team. That open system architecture, pulling new great ideas from Europe pulling the latest and greatest that General Thurgood developed and then moving forward together. But I, I just, I think we do need to, to put it in a, in a framework that's going to be mutually beneficial for all parties. Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Ross, on, on that framework, uh, put it, put it the right, in the right context. All right, Neil, we're going to, we're going to let you uh, close, close this out here before we turn it back over to Mitch Johnson. So Neil, can you give us your uh, final thoughts, conclusions? Uh, yeah, Mr. Secretary, thanks. Uh, uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity today. Sorry about the, the uh, 
the technical. I think that was me, actually. I think I hit the wrong button. Luckily, my IT team came and recovered me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm on a cyber commission with uh, you senators and DepSec Def, so I'm, I'm blaming the Russians. We're, we're good. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, they, they did super, so I'll have to go buy them a, a milkshake after this. Uh, look, I, I think... I think if you look back how we got to where we are, right? So look at the work, Mr. Secretary, that you and the previous chief did together, which set the conditions to move to where we are now with our current secretary in chief and the modernization strategy that we're on. Uh, General Murray working hand in hand with Honorable Jetty on both the requirements and the material side. Those that's, that, that teamwork uh, and that clarity of thought and action, uh, in my mind, is, makes all the difference. When you have the ability to be very directed to what you want and you know what that is, and there's bipartisan support on the Hill for that, given we have a national defense strategy that's focused on our adversaries uh, and our NATO partners uh, and allied partners that have that same focus, then we, we actually have the opportunity to do things different. And we've been given that opportunity. Shame on us if we don't take advantage of that uh, in, in the partnership across all of the services. You know, when, when the secretary asked me to do something, uh, uh, we, the first thing we do is who else in the department's doing it? You know, I, I don't, I don't need to invent a thing. I need to go use what's out there or modify what's out there. I don't need my own contracts. I'll use anybody's contract. If you have a contract that covers the work I need, I'll use it <laughs> because it's faster, it's quicker, and it changes be the behavior. Everybody tradition thinks they have to have their own thing. We need to move beyond that. There's a joint world out there that's doing a lot of great work. And so I use Air Force contracts. I use Navy contracts. I use whatever mechanism gets the task done on the speed and time which we need it. Uh, because we're not going to get another chance at this. You know, the future ahead is going to be hard choices. Uh, whatever whatever happens in the future, we know the budgets are going to be tough. We're going to have to make be prepared to make hard choices. And so we have to be able to, to keep the focus of our soldier while we're executing to the plan that the leadership has asked us to do. And as Ross and, and Tom said, look, our, our job is to execute that plan, overcome the barriers so that we can apply the AI, the robotics, uh, the integration that's happening. Um, we, we know how to do this and industry knows how to do this. And we need to put the tools in place to allow that to happen within the rule sets we've been given. And, and we have our unique opportunity. And it's really, really an honor to be part of that opportunity, to be given this uh, blessing uh, to be part of this team. And uh, great to be here today as part of this panel. Uh, Mr. Secretary, back to you. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Tom. And, and thank you, Ross. You, uh, you three gentlemen were, were, were awesome. Uh, and I, I mentioned my comments. Um, it's really refreshing that to, to have three great Americans who are really, you know, leading from the front to make sure that we're doing all we can on behalf of our warfighters. So we all appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate your remarks and your perspective today. Uh, and let me turn it back over to, to Mitch Johnson. All right, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, gentlemen, I, I'm gonna, I, I have to confess, I thought panel one set the bar extremely high, but you guys did an outstanding job. It was a great dialogue. Uh, first to, to you, Secretary Murphy, thanks so much for leading us through both uh, of these morning panels. Uh, you know, General Kaufman, General Thurgood, General Sharpie, thanks so much for uh, investing the time with us today. Uh, and a special thanks goes to your, your aides and your teams and support teams that helped put all this together. Uh, it, it wouldn't have been possible without them. Um, and last, I want to say just uh, what a pleasure uh, it has been for me to, to be part of this. Um, America's Future Series does some fantastic work. And I, I think everybody, by virtue of who's shown up today and the contributions made, I think everyone agrees with that. 